Okay, members, the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister for Education. Uh, before we do proceed, I would remind members that only one minister will respond to oral questions today and that the remaining Assembly business will resume promptly at 2.45. I call Mr Jim Allister. Mr Allister. Question one. Call the minister. Oh, sorry. Thank the member for his question. It was a little bit premature there. Uh, the department does weekly surveys and the latest data, which includes responses from around about 75% of all schools and preschool education settings, reported around uh, almost 12,500 key worker children as being located on site on Monday the 18th of January. Uh, that would equate on the pure figures out around about 4% of all pupils, but obviously given the fact that it's a 75%, you could extrapolate a little bit further. Those figures don't include children in special schools, which have been asked to reopen for all children. The majority of these key worker children, about 10,500, are attending uh, primary schools. Uh, as the majority of these numbers relate to children uh, attending, as many of these relate to children attending uh, special schools, the number of children and key workers attending mainstream schools is low enough, and there is no reason to assume that social distancing regulations cannot be adhered to. Uh, we have across the board, in terms of attendance, the overall attendance at primary schools is around about 9.5% on the latest figures. Uh, for post-primaries, um, running about, uh, about 5 or 6%. Uh, and for special schools, um, has been in around about 50%. The latest overall figures in terms of attendance, including all categories, is around about 8.6% and has fluctuated between about 89 and 82 across, uh, across the day. Um, on the 8th of June, the criteria for key workers was extended by the executive in line with its coronavirus recovery plan. The definition of key workers was agreed, and there is currently no evidence that the criteria needs to be revisited. Mr. Oliver, supplementary. Well, I must tell the minister I know of a number of schools in my constituency where the attendance level is much higher than 8, 9, 10 per cent. I can think of one school where I'm told the attendance level is in excess of 25 per cent. Now, in such a situation, that's unfair to the pupils who have to be taught at home. It's unfair to the teachers who have to juggle both teaching at home and teaching in the classroom. And it really defeats the purpose, if there ever was a public health reason, for closing our schools if there is a quantum of up to 25 per cent of pupils actually in school. So, given that there has been this extensive increase uh, since the last lockdown, would it not be more prudent to have the key worker criteria as two parents, if there are two parents in the house, rather than one? Because I certainly have been told of cases where there is one key worker and a non-working parent at home and the school, the kids in school. Is that what it is meant to be like? Well, it is, it is meant in terms of the definition of key worker, and indeed, it has been consistently from the start. Now, not all schools have applied it this way, but from the first lockdown, it was on the basis of it being one key worker. Now, the member can uh, highlight some schools that will be outliers in terms of percentages. The, the principal aim, and again, if you talk to the medical experts, um, it is not that schools themselves are not a particularly safe place. It is to try to reduce the overall level of contacts within society. Um, that indeed it is also around the behavioural impact of schools being open. Now, if on the, the situation, and you can, you can take, um, so there is a, a limited level of risk that is directly within the school, but the principal problem is, is the behavioural aspects outside of the school. If across the board we are looking at a situation in which more than 90 per cent of children are not in, then that is removing a considerable element of the, the level of contacts uh, that are within that. Within the situations, different families will operate in, in different ways. And again, part of the issue, I suppose, in terms of a single key worker is to try and ensure uh, that in all circumstances that key worker is available for work. Because, for example, if we take, which is the case in many cases, if you had a family with one key worker and one non-key worker, uh, and indeed there's a level of choice as to who goes into work, it may well be that the key worker is the one who's much lesser paid than the, the, the other member, and if they then have to remain within the home, then there is a risk that actually what is happening is society has been deprived of the key workers side of it. Now, uh, if in a situation all things are always kept under a level of review, uh, and indeed I think what has largely happened, because the definitions have not principally changed, I think there is a broad 
uh, level of acceptance of a general level of confidence that parents have in their children being directly in school, which has arisen in terms of the figures. But I think across the board, the level of figures that would suggest, because they have been fairly consistent over the last three weeks, would suggest that more than 90% of families um, are not, uh, of children are not going to be directly in, in school. I, sorry, I see my, my time is up, but I'm sure it'll come up with. Just by way of housekeeping, before I come to the next member, uh, question number two has been withdrawn. I guess now she him, Sir Karen Mullen. For any case, I call Karen Mullen. Good last can call you. Can I ask the Minister, given the need to deliver effective remote learning, if his department has sought assistance or received offers of support from internet providers to address power broadband for pupils? And also, Minister, I wrote to you on this. Any plans to add providing data to pupils and families struggling? Well, from that point of view on the issue of uh, support, we have worked, I know, in terms of with the devices, with, in terms of the, with BT, in terms of providing additional coverage on that, on that side of things. There is, I think, as part of that, and that can be, I think there's two aspects of that which can then uh, boost the numbers uh, within that, and that has been done. I think the, the issue will be that in certain geographical areas, we will still reach a point that until Project Stratum rolls out, there will be some physical areas that, irrespective of what an internet provider is trying to do, or indeed in terms of the devices, um, that uh, there will be a limitation of what can be provided within, within certain areas. We are working as part of that as well, that in terms of that, the uh, EA is currently has been procuring uh, around an additional about another 10,500 devices um, to add to the 24,000 that are largely out there to try to be able to ease that, that burden as well. But as the member will be aware, in terms of the issues around remote learning, while the issue of connectivity, the issues of um, the number of devices, etc., are an important part of that, probably some of the bigger problems that are there with remote learning would be the, the fact that it is still not as good a, a position as a face-to-face -face learning from the point of view of um, being able to enable the children to have that level of direct focus. And that's something which I think is, is difficult in any set of circumstances to overcome other than with face-to-face -face teaching. Justin McNulty, for your case, call Justin McNulty. Gurmay August Lash Kankora. And in incredible situation, parents and children are dying for schools to reopen, dying to get back to school. Can the Minister outline um, what advice he has got from the Chief Medical Officer and from the Chief Scientific Advisor in terms of reopening schools in February potentially? Well, the member, uh, member will be forgiven in relation to this. There's a limited amount I can directly say that the intention is to bring forward a paper. Um, on the wider situation to the executive on Thursday. I can't really preempt that paper. The executive will take uh, its decisions. We will work always closely with the chief medical officer uh, in particular. The chief scientific officer isn't actually in, in place just at the moment in that regard, but working with those key medical um, experts, and that will form a key part of the thinking as we move ahead. And indeed, I think my officials today were meeting with the PHA uh, to discuss issues moving forward as well. But look, I think I share with the, the member um, a view that, that the sooner we can get back to a situation in which there is that direct face-to-face -face teaching and done in a safe manner, in a manner which is compatible with public health, I think the better uh, for all of us, whether that's parents, teachers and particularly the children. I call Gary Middleton. Number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Okay. Um, as a system, we are significantly better prepared and equipped to deliver remote learning than we were last March. Since the beginning of the 2020, 2021 academic year, my department has asked schools to have contingency plans in place for the delivery of remote learning. Schools are now implementing those plans to deliver uh, remote learning during the next couple of weeks. Due to the dedication of teachers and school leaders, the vast majority of schools have already been delivering remote learning where and when it was needed during the autumn term, but, uh, continuing, continually improving their provision in line with expectations and emerging best practice. At the beginning of January, my department issued an educational continuity direction, which makes it a legal requirement for all preschool settings uh, and schools, be they primary or post-primary, to provide remote learning. Alongside the direction, my department published further detailed guidance for schools on supporting remote learning. This provides additional advice and guidance to schools as to how they can, uh, how they can tailor and adapt delivery of the curriculum. Schools are required to have regard to this guidance. There is much good practice across uh, our system, and my department is monitoring implementation of remote learning through the school managing authorities who will work to support schools who have any difficulties. 
Gary Middleton for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his response? And I do welcome uh, the guidance that has been issued in remote learning. And I know that uh, he will agree with me that face-to-face -face teaching is the most appropriate, but we have to be mindful of the health advice. Uh, can the Minister outline what additional resources have been provided uh, to um, support remote learning within our schools? Well, in terms of the details um, of that, um In terms of the remote learning, so there was um, about an additional seven million have been provided to support remote learning this year. I think that's enabled, uh, first of all, in terms of devices, to make available up to 24,000 devices for learners to continue and improve their online uh, services. I suppose in terms of resources as well, um, the scheme to provide um, the devices and the Wi-Fi access to education disadvantaged to support uh, access to remote learning remains open and uh, as I said EA is currently procuring uh, some more devices there is also as suppose, in terms of the as well as the, the money side of it there is resources in terms of guidance materials case studies to support learning they've been produced by the department as a continuity of learning project and the EA has developed uh, a website um, through C2K my school the best resource and provide a gateway to access a range of online teacher professional learning sessions and webinars. The website collates and makes uh, available the resources and uh, guidance developed through the continuity of learning project, including a number of um, newly developed resources and case studies. There's also, as it was liaison between um, at the start of the process, which are still in place, uh, link officers have been um, put in place for each school uh, those are largely speaking through either the Education Authority or ETI, and the department continues to work closely uh, with them, and particularly with ETI and other educational support bodies to identify additional support materials they developed um, at PACE. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Education Minister for an update on the EA procurement of funded access to the seesaw? digital learning platform for schools to aid remote learning between students, teachers and parents and guardians? I don't have the direct information in terms of the CSO, but I'll get the, the information to the member and make that available uh, to him. Uh, I call Rosemary Barton. Uh, well, I, the member in front has just asked the question that I was going to ask, but I'm wondering, are there, are there any other platforms that you're, that you're considering for uh, primary school children and indeed post-primary school children? I think in terms of the platforms, obviously there's advice that comes from EA through their C2K side of things. I think that can both help primary schools and particularly teachers uh, delivering that. I think we are open to any other suggestions which, which take place um, in connection with that. We, through the continuity of learning programme, we tried to channel uh, those. Um, but again, you know, no one has a, um, has a sort of a font of, of all sort of wisdom in relation to these things. So I, I suppose as we move ahead, uh, as we move further into lockdown, uh, there are programmes which are developing all the time. And I think we're open then to do that. Obviously, we've got to make sure that, that what is there is, is quality controlled and something that is appropriate uh, for the age of our children. Members, there's a fair bit of interest showing in this topic, so I'm going to go beyond the standard days too. I guess here I'm Sir Nicola Brogan for your cast. Garmi, I last in Kerala. Um, I've raised with Mr Weir previously the issue of the digital gap um, has been made more evident because of remote learning. Um, as we've said already today, families struggle to access support in terms of IT devices and printers and in my constituency in West Tyrone, um, families struggle with access to adequate internet connectivity. Given the availability of significant COVID support funding as set out by the Finance Minister yesterday, can the Minister tell us if he will submit a further bid of funding to scale up the provision of devices and to equip pupils with internet connectivity? Well, we have explored. I think there is, as part of the bidding which um, we put, as part of the thing that has been accepted by the Finance Minister, a range of um, additional bids which I think equate to around about 18 million, much of which is the, to sponsor, for instance, the additional devices that the EA is, is doing. We are in a constant position of iteration, particularly with the EA. I think one of the side degrees of barriers to that, uh, and certainly from that point of view, particularly given the funding that is available, uh, there's no lack of willingness from our point. I suppose it's just how quickly certain things can be delivered. And uh, I suppose particularly if we're talking about devices, then there is a procurement lag, which still is difficult to, to overcome 
in terms of a very short term side of it. But there will be those additional devices. Um, as I said, we've also made uh, some of the tools in terms of the, the MiFi and the BT access available. I think we, you do run into a problem. I think the, the member I think identified quite correctly um, that the problem in, with a lot of households is not the lack of a device, but actually the fact that you have a number of members of the family uh, pursuing that, that particular device. I think the other thing which is difficult to overcome, as indicated, is that, that geographically there will be some geographical parts of Northern Ireland that no matter what you were able to put in, because of the lack of broader internet access, uh, there will be some schools will have to operate on a slightly different uh, sphere because simply no matter what can be done from an education end, that there isn't going to be that availability for those, those children as well. But we're constantly liaising with EA to see if there's anything additional can be done that can stretch out what, what can be provided. And I think, given where we are from the broader financial position, is I think the lack of finance is not the issue. It's just how quickly things, from a public procurement point of view, can be turned around on some of those issues. Paul Daniel McCross. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for the answers to the questions so far. Minister, a brief point following on from some of the other members. C2K, some would argue, is largely no longer fit for purpose, given that it's 20 years old and needs to be addressed, and I know the Minister has acknowledged that. Seesaw is worth considering. It's a very good programme. Some members uh, and I have had a rundown of it, and uh, it looks very, very good and, uh, and appropriate. Can the Minister outline what analysis the Department uh, have conducted on the impact of remote learning on children from a deprived background, and whether mitigations have been sufficient in order to address education? Education under achievement? Indicated, I think, in the previous uh, debate, um, there have been a number of reports that have been done during that. There's no doubt that, the, that remote learning will have a level of impact in terms of disadvantaged children and disadvantaged backgrounds. And again, that is not simply, if you like, the, the issue about access to devices. But I think all children will flourish best in an in a environment where they're in a face to face teaching situation on that basis. Um, as indicated, I think there is a strong need. Um, there was, obviously, this year been put in place an engaged programme. I believe that we need to look ahead, and the bids will be made to the executive in terms of the 21-22 funding. Now, I, I should indicate, as I know the member has been active on this particular front, that uh, those who have been engaged through engaged carry on, uh, you know, and as much as possible are trying to deliver what they can through remote learning. I appreciate that I think for a lot of schools they will have tried to focus this in on, on small groups and that does become, um, well not impossible, but does become more difficult under remote, remote learning. Uh, but I think it is imperative then that the executive look favourably on any level of proposals to um, roll out. I know that a number of schools, um, you know, there may be times when, when the member and myself are metaphorically on a seesaw uh, in terms of that. And, um, occasionally struggle to be on, on, on a, uh, a level position on it, but I know quite a lot of schools, particularly during lockdown, particularly primary schools, have used seesaw. So it's, it's not, from that point of view, something that is um, something that has appeared sort of overnight. And I think it's a good example. I think of some of the programmes that, that, that can be used by, by primary schools. I think it's widely used. I think by a lot of primary schools. Mr. Sir Jerry Carroll for your case. I call Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for his answer so far. Just following on from the, the questions around the digital divide, Minister, can you guarantee that all uh, people, uh, pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds, will have access to a digital device and free access to the internet as well? I, I think, from the point of view of guaranteeing any individual, I don't think that guarantee can be given uh, across the board. We are trying to procure the maximum amount of, of devices. Can it be done in every individual case? I think, unfortunately, I think that will be difficult. I think, as I indicated, it is relatively rarely indeed. The feedback that we have gotten, we, we used um, in procuring the first round of devices, we got feedback from schools as to what the needs out there. And there is still, I think, even within the 24,000 initial devices, there are a small number that are still available, still eligible to be, to be claimed on that, on that basis. But I think it would be foolhardy to give uh, a guarantee that every single person uh, will be able to receive um, everything that, that, that is needed. I think all of us can do the best that we can, but it also highlights then that beyond simply the lockdown period, there will be inevitably a need for a level of catch-up, a level of investment in terms of resources in what will be, uh, what will be required for our students as we move into uh, the next financial year. Call John Blair for questions. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number four. The use of academic selection in their admissions criteria is a decision for boards of governors. Uh, it's not just, if you like, a, um, something that is just their general responsibility. They have the legal authority over that. 
I have therefore reminded schools, considering using um, academic selection, indeed using any form of criteria, in the absence particularly of the AQE and the PPTC assessments, they should ensure that a, any alternative approaches are robust, uh, supported by legal advice, and that the process that they have adopted uh, can clearly and objectively select pupils for admission. So there is not a single set of criteria that, that we have been recommending to any school. Mr Blair for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. And hopefully, hopefully he will accept that the lack of contingency planning has caused anxiety for many children and families across Northern Ireland. And with regard to that, can I ask the Minister uh, why he is refusing to use his powers under the Coronavirus Act 2020 and the Education Order 2006 to direct the use of a common contingency criteria for, for post-primary admission in order to insert some consistency and certainty I think in there, exceptional circumstances this year. Sorry, there are a number of reasons, I think, uh, for that. In terms of direction of that, he mentions, for instance, the, the previous Education Order. The power for the Department to direct under those circumstances can only be triggered once the Assembly has taken a vote on whether it wishes to use academic uh, criteria or non-academic, it, it, it only becomes once that trigger point has been made of a decision in relation to that. So that is not a power that is directly open to the Department unless there have been some steps previously taken. I suspect, uh, looking across the Chamber and around the Chamber, getting a consensus on whether there would be academic selection or not um, is something that has eluded uh, for many a year. Directly speaking, I suppose, in terms of the Coronavirus Act, that is principally around the uh, measures to be taken, both in terms of childcare and schools, on either the opening or closure directions to either open and the means that they would be. I think that to stretch that to put in place what the criteria should be um, would potentially be legally questionable and certainly uh, beyond what the intention was of the Coronavirus Act. And I think the other factor is, both in terms of both politically and indeed between schools, there is not a common consensus on what the criteria should be. So. If we are going to move to actually uh, impose on schools a criteria which is against their will, uh, and indeed there are a wide range, some who, for instance, were very keen to embrace academic selection, and there is a legal right to do that, some who uh, would never support academic selection at all, uh, the member would, would have to be clear that they would have to square that, that circle as well. So it is the legal authority of boards of governors uh, to actually set their criteria. We may all have different views on what the ideal criteria should be. And we do give, there is guidance given as to what is reasonable and unreasonable, particularly in terms of um, academic uh, criteria. But I think it would be beyond the powers, certainly of, of myself and the department, uh, to try and impose a one-size-fits-all one solution uh, on that basis. I don't think there is a consensus uh, at any level on what those criteria should be. Sean Lynch, for when you cash to call Sean Lynch. Minister, uh, given your comments following the cancellation of the transfer test that would limit uh, children's opportunities, and I wanted to take an example of St Kevin's College in Lisnesky, which you visited recently with myself, and it's the best known selective uh, school in the north of Ireland, and it's actually outperforming some of the grammars. And I had quite a number of my own family that went to it, nieces and nephews, and they all went on to third level education, and there was no limits to their education. Your comments, Minister, were deeply insulting uh, to a majority of those involved in the education system. Will you take this opportunity to withdraw those remarks and apologise to teachers, staff and pupils who are educated in non-selective schools such as St Kevin's Listen Ski, Gurmalgut? I am very well aware of the excellent work that St Kevin's does in other schools. Schools across the, the sector, be they selective or non-selective, or more accurately, I should say, academically selective or non-selective, because all schools will employ some level of selection in that regard, do an excellent work. Uh, look, from that point of view, I, I did not make myself as clear as I should have done. I apologise for any offence that, that was caused. What I was saying, what I meant to say, and particularly whenever the peril sometimes is social media, you don't always get across your meanings in that regard, is that where any pupil is limited in uh, trying to get to the school they want to get to and is limited by factors that are outside their control, then that is some level of reduction of opportunity, whether that is to a selective school or whether it's to St Kevin's or any. So that was the message I was trying, and I apologise if my language that I used was somewhat clumsy in that regard. 
But what I'm aware of, I think we have a system which actually delivers across all post-primary schools very well for our, our pupils. I know we can be, there is always room for improvement, but when you compare, for instance, our performance uh, compared with other jurisdictions nearby, there's an excellent, uh, and there's excellent opportunities for all. But I just, I feel for any family where, uh, if they are looking to get into a particular school, that that door of whatever school that is, in whatever sector, is effectively closed to them by circumstances that are outside their control. Call Robbie Butler. Uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you, Minister, for your answer. I want to thank the, the member for bringing the question. It's a perfect question. It's, it's probably the issue which has caused me most pain throughout my time on the Education uh, Committee. I do believe that we have failed uh, 16,000 pupils who, in good faith, entered the AQ and GEL test. And I do believe, actually, had the Minister have had the courage, he would have got uh, cross-party support even from those parties that opposed to academic selection and could have used the coronavirus uh, legislation to, to do such. But that, that being the case and the disappointment being there, what are, we, what are you doing it now for the current P6 cohort who will be faced with doing the exam uh, in November to protect their rights under the admissions criteria which do exist, which do have uh, legislative uh, power and cover to make sure that this debacle is not revisited again in November of, of 2021? I think from that point of view, ultimately it's still up to boards of governors to make that, that level of selection. It's clear and we hope to be in a position that as, as we move on into the spring and beyond that the situation will have eased considerably. It, it's noticeable, I think, that for the vast bulk of schools that have um, for example, that, that were academically selective schools and have moved away from it this year, I think fairly, fairly uniformly, I think they've indicated they want to move back towards uh, some form of academic selection. I think that will be available. The problem, and I, I know the member made some very sort of well-reaching efforts to try and, and find a solution, so I uh, give them a very strong, strong commendation for effort in relation to it. I think the problem that a lot of schools found was the issue, particularly whenever they did seek advice, and we advised them simply to seek their own advice. For a lot of those schools, they found that the methodologies of using alternative data would not be particularly robust. There have been, I think, a small number of schools that have used them, but uh, it, it perhaps explains why the vast majority of schools, certainly to my understanding, who would normally be academic selection based, the advice that they have got, particularly from a legal point of view, is that this would be something that would be so open to challenge that they've been reluctant to go down uh, that route. But I think there is an opportunity for better preparation um, for November, and I, I, and I trust that we will be in a better position uh, across the board to be able to facilitate uh, choices from whatever particular direction that, that comes from as we move ahead. To the next question, Sinead Bradley. Deputy Speaker, question five. Uh, yes, I'm pleased to confirm, I know this probably uh, the question predated uh, some of the announcements. Could be confirmed that I've introduced a further income support scheme for substitute teachers on the 22nd of January. The new scheme will operate under similar arrangements uh, and effectively echo what was there before in the scheme prior from April to June. Details of the scheme are available on the Department of Education website, which include information on who is eligible for the scheme, how payments will be calculated, and a straightforward online application form. The closing date for the scheme, because it's effectively reflecting um, how, what levels of work that, that, that teachers had during that period, um, is the 29th of January 2021, and I encourage substitute teachers to apply for the scheme if they are eligible. I should also indicate that for any substitute teacher who, prior to any announcements in relation to uh, the current sort of lockdown situation, had a booking that predated that, uh, those teachers' pay will be, will be honoured within that. And similarly, because I know it was, uh, was raised, I think, by Mr McCross and others in terms of the issue of the Engage programme, quite a number of substitute teachers will have been employed on a short-term basis through the Engage programme. Again, they will still be in a position to deliver that. They will still all be paid for that, that period as well. Bradley. Supplementary question for Sinead. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give an assurance that scoping exercise has been carried out to ensure that all substitute teachers who benefited from the previous scheme are included in this new scheme? Well, the, the position is that it has been made clear to uh, teachers. I mean, the, the issue, I suppose, is anybody who is eligible is entitled and encouraged to apply. The eligibility may slightly differ between the two. It's, it's not as regards individual cases. So to take one example, if you had a substitute teacher who qualified in June of this year or June of last year, uh, they wouldn't have been eligible for the first scheme because they wouldn't have had any opportunity to do any substitute work, but they may well have done substitute work during the autumn. That person would be eligible. 
whereas somebody who uh, was previously they wouldn't have been for the first scheme. So it is, uh, it is entirely open, I think, for every teacher uh, who this applies to to be able to apply for that. Uh, there is encouragement. Indeed, there was a good uptake of it previously whenever we, we did that, and there is no bar to anybody who has previously uh, received it, or indeed anybody new coming onto it. It may also be that there will be, on the flip side, some teachers who would have been eligible previously who, because they have maybe, say, retired completely in the meantime and not done any substitute work during the period in question, that they wouldn't now be eligible. But I think on either side of, those, of that line would be relatively marginal. That concludes the period of listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. And, uh, there she is there, uh, and I call uh, Sinead McLaughlin. We'll give you a minute to get rested there. Just That's, that's quick. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for uh, answering the questions. Minister, um, we have all been greatly alarmed um, to hear about the new variant of COVID-19 uh, and how it could be accounting for 50 per cent of all infections here in the North. But even more alarming is um, that it has uh, is possibly 30 per cent more deadly. In light of these disturbing re re revelations, what additional safety measures are you planning to take to protect our children and staff currently in special schools and indeed more generally um, throughout the mainstream schools uh, when they return? Okay, well, there's a number of points in relation. To, uh, certainly having spoken this morning, um, not breaking any particular confidences, uh, in terms of the issue of deadliness of the new uh, variety, I think there is a considerable level of question marks over that. Certainly the medical profession would say, actually, it is far too early to say it may possibly be that the Prime Minister slightly jumped the gun uh, on, that, on that basis, but nevertheless, it is something to be taken seriously. Uh, look, there have been a range of measures that have been, that have been put in place uh, across the board in terms of schools. So, for example, um, in terms of post-primary schools, the uh, requirement unless it's a medical excuse then for post primary schools to uh, pupils to wear a mask. Obviously we're not at the moment where outside of key workers and um, and vulnerable children that they're in. Uh, there is going to be increased surveillance on school buses. Uh, there is also going to be uh, we are currently working on which will be erected in every school signage because what has actually been said, I think particularly by a lot of the medical experts, is that there's relatively little of what is directly happening within schools themselves. It is the behavioural aspects around schools which are of importance. Specifically on special schools, obviously, I have indicated um, to a number, a number of occasions that I want to see a very swift use of the vaccination process as regards particularly staff of special schools. While I think there is a, a need for prioritisation of education staff in general, I think it should be particularly targeted um, at special schools. Uh, there will be rolling out from this week additional PPE. Um, now, that is not so much in terms of that there is a, any form of recommendation from the medical side that there are additional circumstances, but obviously one of the concerns, particularly in special schools, will be PPE, which is less, e less able for students to pull off um, others' faces. That will be delivered. And also hope fairly soon to make an announcement in terms of additional test and tracing within special schools working with the, the PHA, and I think that will be relatively imminent as well. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your answers. Uh, and, and I suppose all of us in this assembly know that we have taken extra precautions uh, because of the new variant as well. So it's really important that we make sure that our schools, especially our special schools, are, are protected. Uh, and, and, and the rollout of that is very important. I really have nothing else because you've answered my supplementary question about how quickly you're going to do it. So it's imminent. It's soon. Thank you. Chris Little for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Education Minister to set out his plan for how and when children will be returned safely to school? Well, as indicated, I'll be bringing forward a paper to the Executive uh, on Thursday. Uh, there will be further discussions in this afternoon with the Health Minister in relation to that. So until the Executive takes a, um, a clear final decision in relation to that, I'm probably not in a position to be able to share those at this stage with the, the Assembly. But I think it is important that, uh, albeit I think all of us, except we're in a very fluid situation uh, as regards to everything with COVID, that uh, if the executive, for instance, is able to reach a decision this uh, on Thursday, that that is communicated quickly, because as much as possible, I think it's important 
that for staff, for parents and particularly for children, that they are given as much uh, certainty as we move ahead in terms of timescale, notwithstanding the fact that everything always has to be kept under a certain level of review given the speed of movement of, of um, actions. Chris Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Would the Minister agree that a safe return to school has to be a priority for the Assembly uh, and that to do so um, there, that may require increased social distancing and decreased class sizes, which would obviously need extra staff, extra space, extra capacity for digital learning? Has the Minister bid for such extra resources of this nature in order to return uh, schools? as soon and as safely as possible? Well, I think from the point of view of, of what would be needed, I think the problem on that, and it would clearly be one option that was on the table, is that a form of blended learning is, is, um, is considered. Whether that's across the board or whether that's for certain year groups, I think would need to be um, examined. The issue with that is, I suppose, uh, it is not... Um, there is probably some work that around the margins can be done around extra staffing, around extra space, but the practical reality of that will be that you will have some pupils in at a particular time and other pupils then remote learning. Now, there are models that were developed um, as we looked last summer towards a potential blended learning uh, return, uh, and so there are models there which can be utilised in that regard. But obviously, one of the drawbacks of that would mean that, that it would not be on the basis that there would be a, a full return. I think what was looked at uh, last summer, particularly as regards to primary school, was a situation where you had effectively a rota within the week of, of when pupils would be in. That would, in, in and of itself, enable a, level, a greater level of social distancing, um, and that maybe a slightly different model would apply towards um, post-primary school. And I think it's particularly the case as we look ahead towards both the situation post uh, the half-term break and as we look ahead towards the rest of the academic year. That also, uh, while hopefully be outlining in the near future some of the issues around qualifications, may well be that there's also a need to concentrate a lot of our actions around those who are receiving those public um, public examination qualifications, which are so vital in terms of the educational journey that, that children will have to make. Kelly Armstrong for a question. Thank you very much, Deputy. Uh, speaker. Uh, Minister, could I ask you if you believe that a child has a greater, greater opportunity by attending a grammar school? Look, I think, I think uh, to some extent I've answered this from, from Sean Lynch in relation. The issue that I've highlighted is that whenever the opportunity for any child to go to a particular school of any school, of whatever sector, is reduced, then that reduces some level of opportunity. And that's true of whether that's an academically selective school or a non-selective school. We have schools across the board which deliver uh, very strongly for um, all our children. But in the broader level, of, in any sense, whenever choice is limited, when parental choice is limited, then that does reduce um, the individual choices for families and for individual children. Supplementary for Kelly Armstrong. I thank the Minister for that. I find it somewhat disappointing, his answer, given the fact that 20 per cent of children who want to attend integrated schools are turned down from that opportunity because there are not enough places. But, can the Minister, can you confirm that your job is that all children have equal educational opportunities? Therefore, all schools should be being pushed in the direction to provide all opportunities? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly I think we want to make sure that all children are given the maximum opportunities in life. It means then that from what can be provided within schools, there should be the maximum opportunity for all, all children. Now, there will be probably certain practical constraints that will be there across different schools in terms of what can ultimately be delivered. But the aim is to, to give people as much choice as possible. That means, I suppose, as well, I think critically as we move ahead, it's maybe one of those things that, that has not uh, been able to be progressed as quickly as possible. But, for example, whenever we look to uh, ongoing work which will happen in the 14 to 19 strategy with economy, it is about what sim not simply lies within school walls, but what happens beyond that and what uh, wider opportunities can be provided. And I think that level of collaboration uh, will be critical. But as we look to expand opportunity for all, I think that the um, independent review into education will be one of the critical issues that it will want to look at as well. Sinead Bradley, for your question. Sinead Bradley, for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, can you confirm that all COVID costs accrued by schools um, to keep them open or functioning in any form, including substitute teachers, that 
the costs that have accrued and the codes associated that with those will be met outside of the school budget. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the issue in, in relation to that, which is a couple of points in connection with that, there was, I think, a level of bidding, and indeed some of that will be even a reprioritisation of funding. So as part of the overall packages that were sought from the executive at earlier stages, there was specific money set aside in terms of COVID funding, particularly as regards to substitute teachers. That was secured, and I'm talking about for the schools rather than for the individuals in that regard. Uh, that was secured. What we found, um, I think, in terms of financially in relation to that, um, that uh, perhaps the costs were roughly speaking what was needed on that side of things. There's maybe a little bit more that is required. Uh, we find that, that the overall amount that was bid for initially by the EA in terms of PPE, there was probably a certain amount left over. So there's, it's an issue actually of redirecting at times certain levels of costs uh, within that. But we're also conscious, and I think there's been engagement with a number of schools, that where they have had, and working with those schools in the EA, have had specific costs which have not been met, I think that uh, there will be opportunity to try and make sure that those, those are met. The overall impact in terms of school budgets this year, because of a range of factors, has meant that what has normally been the case where schools have, across the board, tended to be in a, a strong deficit situation and lost. This year's actually there's a reasonable surplus that will be there, in part because some of the financial pressures that were there also schools have been reduced. But where there are genuine costs to be met, they, they will be met and be met uh, centrally from that funding. Bradley. Supplementary question for Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Minister. And I'm sure many principals and school management teams will be relieved to hear that, that it won't be coming from their central budget. Does the Minister agree with me in terms of the substitute teachers that we do have a register of qualified, capable, able and willing and waiting substitute teachers who want to engage and be part of the solution in keeping schools open? And could he reach in further to engage with those teachers and allow them to be active during this time? I think you make a very valid point, and I think that is the case. That's why, for instance, whenever the Engage programme, which I know runs alongside that, the, the, the principal source of where additional people can be drawn in, where additional teaching can be drawn in, it's not generally speaking the teachers who are in place in full-time positions. This is about bringing in additional people. And so that has been, been done. I mean, we're certainly very open, uh, and particularly when there's a window of opportunity between now and the end of the financial year, that where schools um, require somebody additional, for example, if there's an element of them having to uh, try and sort of juggle a certain amount of, of supervised learning within schools with the remote learning, I think we're open to any suggestions that can be in, in connection with that. I, I suppose the only caveat I would add across the board, I'm sure nobody would ever do this, is that, that you know, we're genuinely what we've done in terms of the, the COVID situation, where somebody is missing because essentially they've had to self-isolate, there's the opportunity to bring in staff. It's not obviously simply an, an opportunity for, for schools to say, we want, generally speaking, some additional staff in to boost up our, our numbers. I don't think that's the approach that's been taken by schools, but where there's been any level of pressure within the system, that has been met. If there's any overhang of something not being met, then we'll be happy to go back and examine that and try to provide that support for, for schools. I can call Paul Given in for a quick question and uh, response from the Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, statements have been made in the past that uh, our schools are a safe place for children to be educated, and indeed the transmission of the virus takes place outside of the schools in the playground and, and so on. In that respect, um, given that schools took mitigating measures to bubble classrooms, uh, and have put in protective measures for teachers. Uh, what evidential basis was taken to mand mandatory force children to wear face masks six hours a day, five days a week? And what impact assessment was carried out upon children that would be forced to do this? Well, broadly speaking, as regards that, we will always work and coordinate with the chief medical officer, chief scientific advisor. So we will take public health guidance. There was a series of measures. I think what can be done to try to facilitate the maximum number of pupils being in should be done. Around face coverings, it has been something which has been used in other jurisdictions. Um, for post-primary schools, it has not been used, obviously, and intended to be used for, for primary schools. But we believe that we will have, as with all these things, it will have some small level of, of impact and I think is an additional uh, safety measure in that regard. Clearly, there will be individual cases, and in an ideal world, as with a lot of things under COVID, it wouldn't be something that would need to be embraced or look to be embraced, but we believe that this is a level of advantage. 
Clearly, there will be individual cases where um, there will be a pupil, as indeed with some of the other regulations that are there across the board, where for their own particular health reasons, um, either through physical health or mental health issues, uh, that there would need to be some level of exemption given to them. And there is flexibility within the system to build on that. Um, in terms of the implementation side of it, that was able to be announced over Christmas, but, but as then subsequently uh, there was a decision really had to be taken that for the most part that schools would not remain open in the meantime, then I suppose in terms of the testing out directly within classroom environment, then that has not really been able to happen so far. And that concludes topical questions. Thank you, members. If you would just take your ease, please, while we, we change for the next session. <laughs>